Does God want us to be happy? And if so, how can we get there? That's what we'll talk about today. If you hope for happiness in the world, hope for it from God. David Brainerd. Today we're going to talk about the book, God Wants You Happy, From Self-Help to God's Help, by Father Jonathan Morris. I've seen him on television from time to time, and he seems like a, like a good egg. He loves to talk about the love God has for us. And he feels like this whole self-help industry is all about self-help, not about God help. And it only can take us so far. I have a self-help podcast, Start With Small Steps. And I realized when I was going through it that there was a big piece that was missing from the whole scheme. While I use self-help techniques, get better organized, get my goals going the way I want to do them, how to overcome certain hurdles that I have, in the end, I rely on God and on prayer to first help me get through those things. And that's when this podcast became a thing because I realized it was only part of the story. And he says that self-help shows us that we're in control of everything. We're the center of the universe too, which I think is really dangerous. And that we should just do whatever brings us joy. We should find fulfillment in everything we want to do. And we should be free to act in any way we want to act. And that's not exactly what God had set out for us. He wants us to have freedom within the things he wants us to do. For example, he doesn't want us to divorce each other, but we should be free to develop a happy marriage together. So you can see that self-help isn't, again, exactly Christian help. And what's amazing about it, at least to me, is that God being all-powerful, capable of creating a universe and doing everything in it, still cares about us and still cares about our joy and our happiness, and wants to help us as a part of it. That's really kind of stunning. I got asked the question a few years ago, does God want us to be happy? And I thought at the time, the way I explained it was, if we do the things that God tells us to do, we will be happy. We will find happiness. We will find joy. So yes, he does want us to be happy, but by following the things he wants us to do. And I still agree to that. But now I'm doing the Bible in small steps, and I've just reviewed the Beatitudes, the blessing. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And blessed means to be happy. Happy are the meek. Happy are the poor in spirit. And that is a recipe for happiness inside of the gospel and one of the focal points of the things that Jesus told people to do. I'm assured now he wants us to be happy. And he tells us how to get there through his word and through his speaking to his apostles and to the crowds of people. He tells us right out, this is how you can be happy. And so that's where we have to leave our heart open to the fact that God wants us happy and wants to help us happy. Now, his particular plan, he says, is that first of all, we realize, again, that self-help is limited, that our willpower, our strength, our determination tools and technical tools can only get us so far, but God can bring us that next step. Knowing that God could have come onto earth in any form, he mentions, Jesus could have come in the clouds with his angels and all his majesty and declared it so, but instead he lived every ounce of life as a human being. He knows what we're going through. He wanted to see life from our point of view. and. Because of that, when we say God doesn't understand me, God doesn't care about the things I go through, or he can't see the things I'm going through, he can. And then Jesus came and lived like us. So he knows to how to give us the things that we need to get through this life. So his approach, he says, is that he wants us to get away from self-help, but start with God as a help, and then go back to self-help. And I think this is an interesting tactic. We ask for God's help. We want God to help us, but he always has us participate in his miracles with him. He doesn't just boom, make things happen. You can tell he picks people up and he maybe will do three quarters of the work or do, or do almost all the work, but somehow people are involved in his miracle. And he wants us to be a part of his miracles too. 
And so when I think about self-help and my other podcast, having a root centered in God, starting from the beginning with God's help, then we can take those tools of being better organized, having lists or having journals or all the things that my other podcast talks about to make us accomplish those goals too. We can go back to those tools to make us perform better. But in the beginning, it is really God who is leading the way on everything that we want to do. So he says that his plan essentially is that we are junior partners in God's plans in all the things. And God, the Holy Spirit, is our collaborator in almost everything we do. He is the one that gets us off the couch, he says. He puts the burning heart desire in us. He brings the words to our mouth when we ask him to do those things. He suggested that the Good Samaritan was urged to help the poor man who was on the side of the road to help him. So the Holy Spirit is the senior partner. As the junior partner, that means that we're going to be humble, that we're going to boast about God, not about ourselves, so that when we have these victories, we're going to say, we were delivered, we were granted things through God's love. And he says that this will work for the for the very mild person, but also the bulldozery type A personalities, because you don't have to give up who you are in order to have God's help. You just have to face the fact that you have weaknesses. You will always have weaknesses and that God will always have love. And when you're the junior partner, that means your position is to be the junior partner and to let the Holy Spirit lead us through whatever it is we're going through or whatever it is we're going to try to attain. Giving over the reins of our life to God doesn't mean sitting back and watching life go by. True abandonment of ourselves to God's will is not a passive approach to living. Instead, it involves commitment towards developing our talents and personalities to the maximum potential because God has chosen to need us in reaching others. In our diversity of personality traits and skills and passions, as the junior partner, we come together to form this beautiful quilt that reflects God's perfect being. God wants to be involved in our plan, and he wants us to be involved in our plan. So that's where we're going to use this God help to do it. So he says that whenever we're looking at our lives and looking at the things we want to get out of our lives, his first step, he says, is to realize where our obstacles are. And he calls this the root sin. And he said the three major root sins are pride, vanity, and the love of pleasure. We love pleasure. We love to lay back and have the world brought to us and just enjoy life to its fullest. And it's not just a particular kind of pleasure, but those three sins are the root of almost everything that we do. And once we recognize these three things, then we'll be able to overcome the obstacles that are getting in our way of what goals we want to have. Then he wants us to look at how does our root sin, our obstacles, impact us on a daily basis? How is it manifesting itself in our lives that's causing us to not get what we want? If we have too much pride, if we fail to ask God, if we fail to love others, find it difficult to act in moderation or self-sacrifice, how is that showing up in our lives? How is it showing up in our relationship with other people? Then he says he wants you to look at whatever kinds of threats there are that will hinder you from your goal, but also break through your relationship with God. He gives examples like maybe you don't pray enough, or maybe you take God's grace for granted and you don't give thanks, or you think, he's in his example, without thinking about God's plan his love for other people, or his love for you. Now, I was thinking about this a little bit because I have this schedule where I pray when I crawl into bed. I've had insomnia my whole life, and recently I've gotten over it. In a weird way, when I sit there and I pray, when I'm going to bed, I fall asleep. <laughs> Makes me think like the devil is causing me to have great nights of sleep because then I never pray to God because I fall asleep too soon to get my prayers out. So this was a structural problem that I have in my schedule causing me not to pray on a regular basis because I'm in bed. Same thing true is I also listen to a Bible in a year audible book. But if I fall asleep, I never hear it either. He wants us to look at 
how things are affecting us in our interior, like what's going on in our soul and our being, what kinds of activities are going on with our exterior. Are we committing overt sins in public? Are we treating people around us poorly? And then he wants us to look at these threats when it's our relationship with God too. So then he wants us to come up with strategies to overcome those particular root sins or threats. What can you do to make this better? So for me, maybe I need to switch my Bible and prayer time to the morning or to the afternoon, but not right before bed, because what am I really getting out of it? And how is it helping me at all if I just sleep through the whole thing? As an example. So then he wants us to look at what can we do for strategies so that we can be a better junior partner to the Holy Spirit in working out through our goals of happiness or the things we're looking to do. And that's at the part where we admit we're powerless. We realize that we have also done things that are selfish or done things that break our fabric with God because we're living a life of pride. Again, he said vanity or sensuality, living so that we have all the pleasures of life instead of living a God-filled life. So he wants us to address those things individually. He also says, too, that the devil is trying to fight us in all of this. He's trying to whisper to us, to lie to us. Maybe he's telling us we can't have the things that are good in life, or we don't deserve the things that are good in life, or that God will never help us. He's too busy, or he doesn't care about us, or maybe he doesn't exist. But the liar, who is Satan, is always going about and trying to divert us from the right direction. And in the end, we have to accept God's grace, his healing, his gifts, and again, be that junior partner knowing that he may be doing a majority of the work. We're still participating in that work. So he wants us to take a quick inventory of some of those lies we hear in our head. For me, I don't hear negative things that God doesn't love me or that he doesn't care or that I'm a horrible person. Instead, my things tend to be, gosh, you're real tired. Wouldn't it be nice to just relax today? Wouldn't it be nice if you just had a day off? Wouldn't it be nice if instead of doing this podcast, you just did your own thing? It's more of a laziness thing. And I think of it as it's easier for the devil to push in a direction we're already going. You know, I was thinking about like a swing. And if you have a swing and it's going back and forth, if you start pushing against the direction, it's not really going to get you anywhere. But if you push in the direction the swing is going, it will assist you in that. And so why would Satan go and tell you something that's completely off in third base? He would tell you the thing that's close to your heart. And for me, I can be real lazy at times. I think that laziness is the voice of the devil going, eh, why don't you take a break? Why don't you do something else? Why don't you just play a video game all day today instead of working on the podcast or reading the Bible or doing whatever it is I was planning on doing? Then we're going to start listening for the voice of God. That's really hard because people don't really know what it means. And he says that if we don't recognize God's voice, things that we can do are read the Bible. I got the Bible in Small Steps podcast that's just starting today, as long as my website holds up. I'm having a little website problem right now. And study doctrine, which means good doctrine, someone that has a basis in the Bible. And then ask for guidance from the Holy Spirit. And that means sometimes we're going to hear truth he said that we may not like. Because God will always be honest with us. He's never going to lie to us just so we feel better. But he's also going to accompany that with his healing. So he has something he calls the faith, hope, love, cure. And that we want to get to this place where we're healthier where God is the center of us, our home, our neighborhoods, our families, everything has that God-centeredness. And he does so with the virtues of faith, hope, and love. And the author wants us to do that on a daily basis. And so he says that he wants us to step into a faith of yes, that we're going to step out with God, believing that God is participating in our lives, understanding us, and wants us to be happy, wants us to be successful, wants us to use the gifts that he gave us to be born with, as long as these things are in line with the things that God told us to do and away from the things that God told us not to do. 
So we're in this place where we, he says, we can have this union of faith that we can now believe in God, study the scripture, involve ourselves in prayer on a regular basis. And so that's the first part is faith, that we have this faith that allows us to focus. He suggests that we get into a place where we are in a posture to worship and listen to God. He says in some cases that might be a comfortable reclining chair, but other people might think that's kneeling in a church or sitting on the floor or sitting on a log in the forest. Then we're going to place our mind and heart in the presence of God. We're going to focus on God. We're going to invite God to come into our presence and we're going to listen. He says that we're going to be humbled. Because if we're too arrogant or too prideful, we won't hear what God says because we think we're the ultimate authority on what we should do or what's in our heart or how we should act. And we instead should have that level of meekness or humility to accept God in. And then he says, go ahead and read some scriptures, some passages of the Bible. He says that this is not a Bible study or an analysis, but just read it. Use our brains. Use our emotions, and look at what that passage even says. And that's how we can get closer to looking at God. And then we go into prayer, where we start thanking God, asking Him questions, asking for help, asking Him to strengthen us, and asking Him to be that full senior partner in our life. And then all of this takes commitment of doing this on a regular basis. And that is how we'll get to know the Word of God, and we'll be able to hear Him. And then the next part is hope. Hope comes because we believe God is there, is present in our lives, has chosen us to be part of his plan and to go about doing his work, that he has given us the strength and the ability and even does majority of the work to get us those things. And so he says, in order to have hope, we're going to take a look at our lives. We're going to admit to God that we have done wrong, and we're going to turn our wills over to God. We'll make amends to anyone that we crossed, and then we're going to follow a plan to hold ourselves accountable. If we're doing something to our families, maybe we're drinking too much, maybe we're too angry all the time, we're going to come up with a plan that will help us follow through on where we've asked people around us for forgiveness, and we will try to do better. He says that this will give us resiliency, that's his his word, and even use God as a crutch. He says that people will often look at that as a terrible thing, but crutches allow people who couldn't walk to walk. There's nothing wrong with relying and depending on God. And so when we get over this self-sufficiency or this superiority that we can do it on our own, that's when God will enter our lives. And then the next part is love. We have to go through and see that Jesus lived a life of love. He calls us to live a life of love, knowing that because God loves us, and that will therefore mean we should love other people because he loves them as well, it will allow us to do extraordinary things. It will allow the Holy Spirit to be the senior partner in our lives, and it will give us that connection we need to God so that we can accomplish amazing things. He says the pattern is pray, think, and act. So ask for God's presence in your life and pray to him. Think. He says that God gave us an amazing mind, and it's true. We can do so many things with our minds, and yet sometimes we don't do the right things with our minds. But now we want to use our minds in the right ways, and then we're going to act. According to the scripture, God would have us act like. And then he says that we're going to consult regularly with our senior partner, the Holy Spirit. We're going to consent to him to help us, which means we're not going to say it's all me, but instead, God, please help me. We're going to ask for the thing that we're asking for. And then together with the Holy Spirit as a senior partner, we're going to do amazing things. And we'll be able to overcome great odds and use everything that God gave us, the unique human being that God made us, and do amazing things while we give our thanks and brag about God and all the things he helped us with. So my challenge to you is can you find time every day to get close to the presence of God where you'll 
immerse yourself in a scripture passage. You'll pray to invite God into your life and into the problems you have and be in whatever position, whether it's sitting or kneeling, that will make you feel that presence of God closer. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. I am moving websites, and so there might be a little bit of a kerfuffle when it comes to downloading the podcast. If it doesn't download, please try again later. Hopefully, this will clear itself up within the next week. I hope it doesn't go beyond that. Then everything should be much better. I've improved the servers and the hosts of everything that's here. So I'm releasing this podcast a day early to announce the brand new podcast, hopefully starting today, The Bible in Small Steps, which is going to be a slow roll through the Bible. I love the Bible in a Year podcast, but it's difficult at times when you think about a Bible in a Year podcast might take Matthew 4 through 7 and go through them on the same 15 minute podcast. In 4 through 7, you have the Beatitudes, the Blessed Rs, you have the Lord's Prayer. You have a number of life lessons like judge not lest they be judged. And you can't really do a deep dive at all of that unless we're going through it a little bit more slowly. So I invite you to come and listen to the podcast. Again, a chapter a day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Then you can read the next chapter on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Maybe do your own deep dive and see what those passages mean. I have a worksheet called the Ramps Bible Study. That's read analyze, meditate, pray, and share that you can download the blank template, but I will also provide links in the podcast to a database where these are filled out and you can just download my template. Or I'm going to fill out the analyze part of it every week and you can just download my worksheet of the analyze part of it. Again, I'm not a pastor, but I have a lot of resources. And so I want you to be able to look at what I've done Maybe you agree, maybe you disagree, but it's a starting point for you to do your own study of the word in small steps. So I appreciate it. The Bible in small steps, if you're interested, it is now live on Apple and I'm getting it posted to other services very soon. (laughs) Basically, as soon as the website gets moved to its new host. So thank you very much. And remember, our walk towards happiness starts with small steps.